and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. All right, so for starters, we're going to talk about the beard because it's the white elephant in the room. Um, <laughs> so if you guys remember last week, I uh, told you guys that uh, we had a little, I didn't give them a little challenge um, that I would let them dye my beard pink if we would have 100 students or more. And so they, they, they did awesome. They invited their friends. We had over 100 students. Actually, yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, we actually had 118 students. So it was the most we've ever had at Fuse here before. So very, very cool. So that's, that's, the good, that's the good part of this. Um, the bad part is I had to dye my beard pink, which I think we got a picture up there. I, yeah, I know. I, now, I'm going to say this. I didn't pick that picture out. That was our tech guys picked it out. I just, we said, get, get us a, a picture of the beards. Okay, there it is. All right. Um, so anyways, this is a great night. Awesome, awesome stuff. Now, more, more important than the numbers and all that stuff is this. We had one student that I set through Christ, and that is why we do it. All right, it's good stuff. Yes. Yes, so good stuff, good stuff. All right, um, hey, this week we're going to jump right back into our, our uh, Recalibrate series. We're focusing on discovering God's will for our lives. And last week, Pastor Zach kicked us off in this new series, and he talked about focusing really on God's sovereign will, which definitely can be challenging and a little complicated and difficult. Um, he highlighted the life of Job, if you remember that. Uh, which is a great example of God's sovereignty and his will in his life. And remember, God allowed Satan. Satan came to God, and he allowed him to really come into servant Job. In fact, God was like, hey, I got this guy, Job, who uh, he's, he's a great God follower. He loves me. And uh, go ahead. Like, you can, you can go ahead. And you, can, you can, like, try to mess his life up, but I really believe he's going he's gonna to follow me. He's going to continue to do it, and which Job does. We know that. But Satan just just comes at him, right? Wreaks havoc after havoc. And uh, those four servants come. Remember, this is a matter of like five, ten minutes or whatever. They come to him. They're like, hey, uh, Job, um, man, first of all, bad news. Uh, your houses and barns completely demolished, like gone, done. Um, all of your livestock, all of it, it's gone, all that. But more importantly than that, or really the worst out of all those, was he lost his entire, all, all of his kids, all of his kids. And so it's like one tragedy right after another, after another, after another. And if you remember, Job's friends, they would question him and they would say, uh, hey, hey, Job, man, what, what sin did you do? Like, what is it? Like, God wouldn't just allow this to happen. What sin did you do? There had to be something, Job. Come on, let's talk about this. Well, what did you do? You gotta confess this. Like, you gotta tell us what's going on. But if you remember, that wasn't the case at all. It was simply just God's will and the life of Job. I mean, how could God allow all this pain and suffering? See, God doesn't show up and answer all of Job's questions, all of his questions, but the ultimate purpose of Job's suffering is this, to bring glory to God, which is what our life's purpose is. And so that being said, I mean, that's a hard thing to, for us to like, to, to think about, right? I mean, that God would allow that just for his glory. But if you know this about the life of Job. Um, I know as a pastor in counseling, people have, you know, been going through tragedy, maybe not nearly as severe as this, but something that would, you know, be on those same lines of it's, it's a tragedy to them. And a lot of times as a pastor, we point back to the book of Job as, hey, God can get us through this. And so the book of Job has gone to help out many, many Christians make it through, See, if our life is to glorify God, then you know, we, we have to be okay with whatever God decides in life. 
And that message of God's will is sovereign will, again, a difficult one to hear, but it's one that we have to, we have to hear and apply to our life. Job taught us that God's sovereign will, it is always good, regardless of whatever it is that happens through that. And so today, we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to talk more about knowing God's will and, and different decisions we're making in life. And we want to know God's will. God, should I, I make this decision? And so that's a lot of times, again, as a pastor, people come to us, they ask us those questions. Well, today, we are going to look at something that's going to help with those questions. We are going to look at really, really three very important truths when it comes to God's will or his desire for our life. Now, that's what I want to do, okay? Um, I'm going to get real with you guys for a second. Okay, here at Grace, typically how we preach is we take a passage, like Pastor Zach took Job last week, the book of Job, and we preach on that text, which is the way that we really feel like, like it's the best way to preach, break down a text, talk about it, apply it to our life, good to go. But for this week, it's going to be a little bit different, okay? Um, we are going to be talking about the topic of God's will and specifically his revealed will, um, which is all the message is going to be about. And so that's going to cause us really to do this. We're going to be in a lot of places in the Bible. Like we're going to be going... All over the New Testament, we're going to go way back to one verse of the Old Testament. So just be ready. If you've got your Bibles, you're turning around. We're going to be all over looking at different passages. But the reason for this is this, is uh, we're using it to set up the idea that God has revealed his will in Scripture. And he's going to tell us some things that really are going to help us in the decision-making process of life. So get ready. If you've got your coffee, world-famous Grace Community Church coffee, you need to take a sip, that's fine. Okay, you need to get up. Go get a cup of coffee out there. Like, that's fine. Go get it, all right? But uh, we're going to jump right into it. Okay, so last week, God's sovereign will, we talked about that. W what God wants to happen for his glory, it's simply will. And today we're going to talk about something more specific. So what I'm going to do to kind of illustrate this, just first of all, is um, I'm going to pull up just a couple pictures here, okay? And I need some crowd involvement, so that's all you guys, okay? I need you guys to do something for me. Um, we're going to pull a picture up, and I want you guys to just guess and you can raise your hand for whoever you think it is. I want you to guess whose desk you think that this item is on, okay? And so you have four options, okay? You've got myself, AJ, you've got Blaine, all right? You've got Jacob, and then you've got Zach, okay? So, so just, uh, we've got a couple of them, but um, we'll start with the first one, all right? And so let's go ahead, let's see what we got first. All right, we got a coffee pot. All right, so maybe think about what you know about your pastors, worship leader, Jacob, all that stuff. Okay, all right. So how many of you guys say, hey, AJ, I think this is on your desk? Raise your hand. Okay, all right. A few of you guys, all right. How many of you guys say, I think this is on Blaine's desk? Raise your hand. Someone said, I do. Okay, all right. All right, it's quite a few more. All right, Blaine, you're in the lead as of now, dude. All right. All right, how many of you guys say this is on Jacob's desk? Raise your hand. Okay, a few more. All right, probably more than, than Blaine. All right. How many of you guys would say that's on Pastor Zach's desk? All right. Uh, okay, a lot of people didn't raise their hands, but I think the most went to Jacob, which, in all honesty, you guys are correct, it is on Jacob's desk. Good job, all right? Um, which is always kind of fun because I can just be like in my office, open the door, be like, hey, Jacob, um, make me a pot of coffee, and interns, what they got to do, so they do it. So this is his desk, by the way, which has a printer on it. It's kind of in a random place. Uh, he wanted to work for us, and so we just threw him over on that desk, but he does a good job, though, so. Okay, all right, we got the next one. All right, here we go. All right, we have iced, cuff, iced coffee from Circle K. All right, um, anybody had those before? You guys drink those? Do you guys? Okay, all right, I've heard they're good. I don't know. All right, so let's go ahead and let's see who we got here. How many of you guys would say, um, this is on Blaine's desk. This is a, this is a Blaine thing, I think. Okay, okay, all right. How many of you guys would say, AJ, that's on your desk? That's right, not that many hands, because I don't drink those girly drinks. That's right. Okay. All right. How many of you guys say, on Jacob's desk? Well, a couple of you guys, okay. All right. All right. How many of you guys say, it's on Zach's desk? I wish Zach was in the room. He's out in the atrium right now. Zach, your people know you too good. That is on Zach's desk, which we're not surprised, drinking a girly drink. Now, I will say, I was, I, someone told me this when we were talking about it, all right. Someone told me that, hey, uh, Zach, multiple times, until he started drinking, it was about a month or two ago, he would rip on people from stage for drinking, like, the fruit fruit girly drinks, which we find it kind of ironic. Now he's all into it. So, all right. So, all right. But, hey, I just, just did that, just as an example, right? Um, just like these items, they reveal whose desk they are that we were looking at. Um, today, we're going to talk about some things that God has revealed 
for us to follow in Scripture, his revealed will that he's told us to follow in Scripture for when we're making different decisions in life. Now, before we get to these things, God, he reveals uh, what he talks about, uh, his will for, for our life. One thing I just want to do is I just want to take like a second. I just want to just to think about this, okay? Um, God's will, and, and I'm sure we've, you know, all of us have experienced this. At times it could be like a mystery or wondering or not sure on stuff. But what I absolutely love about today's topic is this. God lays it out for us and says, this is my will for you, for everyone that's in here. For all of humanity. So it's really cool that God does that. And now think about this. The creator of the universe, right? The God of the heavens made the mountains, made the seas, right? Made the stars, the moons, all the galaxies. He gives us specific things that he wants us to follow. No mystery, no guess. So that's where we'll be at, all right? Now, you may be thinking, okay, cool, AJ, that's great. Where are we going to find this stuff out at? Like, where is it at? Well, Pretty simple here at Grace. We're about the Bible, and so that's where we're going to go. We'll start with this, 2 Timothy 3.16. It says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. So this morning, we're going to look at how God reveals his will to us for our lives based on what the Scripture says, 2 Timothy 3.16. Now, the three things that we're going to look at, we're calling them timeless truths, okay? So we've got three timeless truths we're going to look at today. Um, now, you know, I, I will say these things, they are truly timeless. They, they were true 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, just like they're true to this very day. And, and I'll say, like, there, there's a lot of other things that God reveals to us in Scripture. Um, we'll get into some of those in the next couple of weeks. But I feel like these are three of the most important things that God reveals to us, Grace Community Church, for today. So first, let's, let's just think this thing through of, of following God's will, his revealed will. Um, go back to the Garden of Eden, okay, Genesis. We've got two, two uh, people in the Bible, or two people at the beginning, and uh, that's Adam and Eve. They're in the Garden of Eden. They're doing life, and God creates them for a love-based relationship with them. Now, he gave them one rule, right? One rule, that was it. Don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's in the very center of the garden. So that was their one rule, okay? Don't eat from that tree. All right, don't do it. And what do they do? They eat from it, right? And sin enters into the world. And so from then on, on this earth, we have we live under the penalty of sin. See, we are obligated to obey God, but we have the ability to disobey him. God didn't make us robots. He gave us the free will so we can choose to follow him and choose to obey him, which is going to be the same in these things that he's revealed for us. These things that he's revealed for us, he's not going to force us to do these. We have a choice. And so the first timeless truth I want to look at is this. And God wants you to be saved. I mean, God wants you to be saved. And maybe you're thinking this. Yeah, AJ, of course you would say that. Like, you're a pastor. Of course you would say, God wants me to be saved. And you're thinking, like, I don't need that. Like, why, why can't you give me some other different revealed wills of God? Like, I want some other ones. Well, because here's the deal, okay? Your greatest need is Jesus whether you realize it or not, if you have not come to place in your life that you've trusted in what Jesus did on the cross, was payment for your sin, the greatest need in your life is to make that decision and give your life to Jesus. The greatest need isn't a promotion at work. greatest need isn't marriage. greatest need isn't any other kind of relationship or something, money, a house. None of that. None of that. Those are all just secondary things, right? Our greatest need is Jesus. Because here's the reality. Every single one of us, we're going to spend somewhere forever. Every single one of us, from the youngest, the oldest in here, we're going to spend eternity somewhere forever. See? So why is this the most important one? The, mo the first and most important one that we need to filter all of our decisions through? Because here's the deal, guys. Hell's hot and forever's a long time. I'm just being honest. <laughs> forever's a long time to be separated from the love of God from his compassion, from his forgiveness, from his mercy. See, our greatest need is Jesus before anything else. Check out what it says, First Timothy 2, 3, 4, kind of it proves this point. This is good and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved. Right there it is. This is good and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This verse, it's the offer of, of salvation to all. It's a universal offer of salvation to all. Regardless of who we are, what we've done, our background, all that, God wants us to be saved. We know that because it's revealed in Scripture. Verse 4, I mean, you could replace the word everyone with you. 
this is good and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants AJ to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can put your name right there. See, this is the only verse that, that supports that God's will is for all of us to be saved and, and how we can be saved. I mean, um, think about the story of Nicodemus, this religious leader. Uh, and he comes to Jesus and he asked him, he's like, teacher, uh, he says, he says what, what do I do to be born again? Like, how can I be saved? And how does Jesus respond? Most probably famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3.16. So we'll read John 3, 16, 17, 18. It says this, for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. He tells him. He shares it with us. And like, you were dying for. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, Romans 5, 8, says, but God proves his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He, doesn't, he didn't just prove it on the cross. He continues to prove it to this very day. Jesus tells us this, that, man, we were worth dying for. There's no limit to who God can save. And that truth, man, it goes to our human history, and it resonates to this very day. So if you're still living, you've got breath in your lungs, and you're in here this morning, and God's will is that you come to him in faith. I mean, I challenge you to consider that today. Romans 10, 9, it tells us how we can make that decision today. It tells us how we can come to faith in Christ. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But here's the deal. Remember, I said this earlier. We're at the Garden of Eden. We have the option. We're commanded to obey. But God gives us the ability to disobey. That means this, that there's probably someone here this morning that are going to hear this message, that aren't followers of God, and they're going to hear the truth that's presented. They're going to hear how God loves them, how he wants to have a relationship with them, and they're going to push it off. I mean, we have the choice. What do we do with it? And God reveals this, hey, you're worth dying for. And the second thing, the second will that God reveals to us in Scripture we're going to look at today is this. It's our mission for believers. We can't understand this mission, which we're going to call the Great Commission. We'll go there in a little while. But we can't understand it without looking at, really, the greatest command. And the gospel accounts, remember, uh, these religious leaders, they come to Jesus, and they ask him, Jesus, hey, what is, what's the greatest commandment? Like, what's out of all the commandments, what's the greatest one? You guys remember what he tells them, right? Love your neighbor yourself, right? Love others. Put others before you. It's the, it's the golden rule. But it's interesting what happens, the verse we're going to read in a little bit, John 13. So the, the, one of the last conversations that Jesus has with his disciples, he's with them, and he tells them how to love. And he says this, I give you a new command, love one another. Okay, we got that, Jesus. You, we know that. He told his religious leaders already. But look what he says next. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, it's simple, right? Love one another. But did you catch what Jesus said? Love one another, yes, but do it as I do. Love, love others as I do. Put them before you as I do. I mean, but here's the deal. Can we really do that? I mean, can we really love others sacrificially? I mean, most of us, if we're honest, we don't obey, obey the golden rule. So how can we do that? We need to strive. I mean, we're going to fall short at it. I mean, we're not always going to be able to do that minute by minute, day by day but we're called and commanded to strive to love others like that. And when we mess up and we don't love people like that, man, get back on track, ask God for forgiveness, and love how we should. We're going to fail at it, though. I mean, we're broken, messed up people. But it's interesting what Jesus says. He says, strive to love others like me, and it should proclaim like that truth that God loves them. There's a world that's watching that's why he says in verse number 35, he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And let that love show in us. Um, last night, the Buckeyes dominated Wisconsin. Good stuff, right? All right, that's great. Here's the deal. If you're a Buckeyes fan, you're gonna yell, woo, or whatever. I mean, you're gonna do that. You're, you're pumped up about it, right? The Buckeyes, it was a big game, awesome stuff. Great performance by our Buckeyes. 
I mean, you're gonna let it show. You're probably gonna talk about it. Work tomorrow with your buddies at lunch table or wherever, like you're, you know, other teachers at school. You're gonna talk about it because you're a Buckeyes fan. That's gonna show. It's the same to be true in our Christianity. I mean, if we're a Christian, it should show in how we love others. And I think that the greatest way that we love is by sharing the, truth, the message of truth. And see, in truth, it surpasses feeling in relationship. Truth is always more important than a feeling. The greatest message of truth that we can give to those that we're closest to and, and anyone, the greatest message of love is this. It's the gospel, the great commission, which is what God has revealed to us as believers is our will for us to be about sharing. At the 20, 19 to 20, very first word, go. That's key. That's super important. All right, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. For his disciples to obey this command, and for us to obey this command, it requires this. It requires that we go. I mean, it's an action where it requires us not to sit idle, not to lay around, right, but to seize the opportunity because there will not always be an opportunity in our life to share the gospel with someone. I'm sure that every one of us in this room, we had an opportunity to share the gospel with people at work and at Walmart, the gas station, and our family maybe even, our friends, and we chose not to. And we have to be, we have to get hit in the face with these things. We have to get hit in the face of scripture. That way it challenges us and calls us to remember our purpose as believers and our will, or God's will for us is this, that we are about sharing the message of Jesus. I think about it. Let's, let's just say this, okay? Let's just say that the disciples, other believers around, that they heard this message and they just said, you know, like, okay, Jesus, hey, um, you want us to go make disciples of all nations, tell them about Jesus? Uh, we're going to hold off on that. We're, we're just going to bank that for a little while. Um, maybe that's for another group of people, but not, eh, that's not really for us. Okay, think about this. Where would our eternity be? I mean, where would the church be? Would Grace Community Church exist? I mean, this is huge, and we can thankfully say that did not happen, right? And they went out and they shared the gospel. If you know anything about all the disciples, I mean, they were, they were about sharing their faith, even the face of persecution. Um, a lot of them died as martyrs, which simply just meant this. They wouldn't shut up about Jesus. Even with a sword at their throat, they're going, no, man, we're going to tell others about Jesus because it is the most important message in human history. A lot of times when it comes to the Great Commission, we have this idea that it's, you know, God, if I say, you know, if I, if I, if I do this, then God, you're going to call me a missionary all over the world or whatever. And that's scary. That's crazy. Well, hold on. Hold on. Okay. Let's just, let's just hit it. Let's pump the brakes. All right. We have a mission field right here in Tiffin, Ohio, across the street, across the assembly line, in the next room with the other teachers. We are in contact every single day. God has put people in our path every single day that need to hear the message of Jesus. To put them in your life so you'll reach them for him. We had uh, 27 people two weeks ago that uh, were baptized, which is an absolutely incredible thing. And uh, I mean, very, very cool. And we had six students that were baptized, which as a student pastor, man, it just pumps you up, you get excited about it. And a couple of those students, uh, their names were Elise and Paige. And Elise and Paige, really good friends. Uh, it was probably, I don't know, about a year or so ago. Elise, she started coming to our student ministry, went on our big Kalahari trip. She invited her friend Paige to go on the Kalahari trip. And uh, Elise, a short time after that, she gave her life to Christ and put her faith in him, and what he did on the cross was for her. And uh, she kept inviting her friend Paige, and, and Paige came to Fuse every single week. She'd come every single week. And then eventually over this last summer, Paige made that decision to give her life to Christ, which was an incredible, incredible thing. Both those students were baptized last week. Man, how cool is that? That's our students living out the Great Commission. I mean, super, super cool to think about that. All right, and then let's just prove this a little bit more, Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you, we do this in our Connect class, so if you've been to Connect class, you've heard this before. I'm going to ask you to do this, okay? I'm going to ask you just to raise this hand to whatever applies to you for how you came to Grace for the first time, okay? Um, and, and we'll go all around the room, and okay, we'll go from there. All right, so first, how many of you guys came to Grace Community Church because of our advertisement? Even like a mailer that was in the mail, okay? All right, okay. One, all right, okay. How many of you guys came to Grace because of the billboards that we did for a little while? One, no? Okay. All right. No one? All right. 
All right, how many guys came to Grace because of our Grace Kids Few Student Ministry Young Adult Programs? Okay, couple. All right, now, how many guys came to Grace because you were invited by a friend to come? Okay, so keep your hands up. All right, look around the room. Look around the room, right? I mean, that's how people, again, they, they come to grace, right? It's super cool to think about this idea that God, he reveals his will for us in Scripture, that, hey, my will is that we would be about sharing our faith. And then you look around this entire room, and Grace Community Church is made up of people that someone else, maybe a friend, maybe a family, a coworker, said, hey, why don't you come to grace? I, I think that you would... And I think that you'd really like it. Or maybe they shared the gospel with you, said, hey, this is the difference that Jesus made in my life. Man, I think you should come check it out here at Grace. All right, it's super cool to think that God uses people, right, uses people to get the message of Jesus out. It doesn't have to, but often that's what he does. Super cool. All right, so yes, God, he's ultimately in control and his will is gonna be accomplished, but he reveals that through us sharing the Great Commission, sharing the message of Jesus. If you believe that message and you've been saved, man, how can we not share it? It changes our eternity. God's put people in our life to share that story with. So next thing we'll look at, the last thing is this. What's the last revealed will for God that he wants every Christian in here to know? It's this. Man, live worthy of the gospel. Live worthy of the gospel. Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I just want to pause and say this real quick, okay, this could be like an entire sermon series, just these two verses, okay? So I'm not gonna do it justice. We're gonna skim over it, okay? But Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Paul, this guy that writes this letter to these churches, he's been writing to believers and he's challenged them really in their faith and how they should respond with wholehearted commitment to living for God. And so he tells them to live a sacrifice. Now, we've got to stop right there. What does it mean to live as a sacrifice and how can we do that? See, our true worship, it requires offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, which means dedication of really our, our total person to God's honor, who we are, our life, that is our talk, all right, what we do with our time, how we spend our money, different resources, how we manage all those different things. All right, our life, it should all be different. It should be different than our culture because our, our life has been changed because as Christians, we've been called to be set apart, to be different in how we live. See, God's revealed his will for us in Seneca County to live as a sacrifice, which is worship to God, as the end of verse number one says. And verse two said to be transformed, transformed from who we were before Jesus to who God wants us to be after Jesus. He gives the format of how that happens. It's really cool. It talks about renewing our mind and how we do that is to spend time in prayer, right? focus on, on God and talk to him and ask him for strength and pouring, our, pouring out our, you know, our needs to God. Spend time in the word, right? studying and applying, meditating on the word, letting it transform and change us and then fellowshipping with other believers. And renew our minds as how we are transformed by spending our time, our mind focused on godly things. And when we do that, and God promises the Spirit's gonna work as Christians, and he's gonna drastically change our life. And this is his re revealed will for us Christians. Honestly, just wanna summarize up what we've talked about today. You go to Micah 6, 8, verse in the Old Testament. This is kind of a summary of everything we talked about today. It says, mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it is that the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. In closing, if you remember last week, Zach's message, he focused really on God's will and how ultimately good or bad it is used to glorify God. We saw last week how Job went through everything he went through and how God was still glorified. And we would say this, this week it's the same thing. God wants to be glorified in these decisions that we're making. See, we have the opportunity to glorify God and to follow him and what he's revealed to us. And so, you know, the first thing we talked about is this. Maybe for those of us in here that are not, not Christians, you've not made the decision to give your life to Christ. I think it's plain and simple. Right? God laid it out to you, to all of us, that his revealed will for your life is that you put your faith in what he did on the cross. I mean, that's it. 
So if you've not made that decision today, man, grab myself, grab Blaine, Zach, one of us, man, we'll, we'll talk to you about it. Mark on the connect card that you wanna talk to us about making that decision. Drop it off the info center. Maybe you are a Christian and man, you realize that you got hit in the mouth this morning. You're not, you're not doing the action part. You're not going out and telling people about Jesus. And we're all, every single one of us, myself, Zach, Blaine, every Christian, every one of us, we're guilty of not doing this how we should. Man, that's why we need messages like this to challenge us to get out and to share that message. If it drastically changed our life, then we should be pumped up about sharing it. And last again, for the Christian in live a life worthy of the gospel. God's told us that. His will is that our life is a living sacrifice to him in worship. And how can we do that this week? See guys, when Jesus, he comes into our heart, everything changes. God, he's revealed himself to you this morning. So my question is, how will you respond? Let's pray. God, we thank you. Lord, for letting us just come before you now, this morning and just talk a little bit about your word. And, and God, one thing I absolutely love about this, this topic today, about your revealed will to us, is the fact that, God, sometimes your will can be a mystery. Sometimes it can be difficult to understand. But God, we're thankful that our creator of the universe who loves us, died for us. Let's say, hey, Grace Community Church, I got a few things for you that I'm gonna reveal to you in scripture. I want you to, man, I want you to be saved. I want you to give your life to me. I want you to be about sharing the message of Jesus with others. I want you to live a life and that's worthy of the gospel. That's changed and transformed. And help us to live that out this week, we pray. I ask this in your son's name. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.